السلام عليكم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خير المرسلين محمد النبي الأمي وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأحل لقطة من لساني يفقه قولي It's truly an honor to be at the Masikna Convention again uh, for another wonderful year another wonderful conference and the topic that I have is actually very near and dear to my heart Islam is relevant but are we are we as Muslims relevant and there's a question that was posed to me maybe twice in the last few days and I want us to reflect on it it's attributed to a philosopher named George Berkeley people say it's not actually his it's a philosophical question. If a tree falls in a forest and no one is around to hear it, does it make a sound? Some would go so far as to ask, does it even exist? And even though we know the real answer is yes, the question is philosophical in that if something happens and nothing around it recognizes or acknowledges that, is it even there? And so I'm going to ask a different kind of question, which is, if an Islamic center or a masjid is shut down tomorrow, God forbid, and none of the non-Muslim neighbors protest or even notice, was that center actually there? Was that center actually impactful? Was it doing anything? Was it a prophetic space? Or did it just barely exist? In theory. So we know that Islam is relevant. But when we look at ourselves as a Muslim community, and we ask these types of questions about if something were to happen to one of us, or to one of our institutions? Would people come out out of love for those institutions? Not, not out of a moral obligation, but out of love for what those institutions are doing for the greater community. Would people come out to defend us and to stand with us? Reflect on your masjid. Reflect on your organization. Reflect on the work that you're doing in your communities and think about how your community would respond if all of a sudden it experienced your absence due to some kind of a shutdown. One of the things that really struck me when I learned about Malcolm X and the video footage that is there regarding his assassination, rahimahullah, is how people just poured out into the streets People poured out into the streets when he was killed, when he was taken away from them. And they were Muslim and people of other faiths. Actually, he didn't even get a janazah, a, a, like a, his funeral was held in a church. He affected so many people that losing him was a big deal to them and still is a big deal. This is the way that we, when we think about are we relevant? We have to ask, are we touching the lives of the greater society? Are we only concerned about ourselves? Or are we concerned about winning the rights and winning the, you know, the, the way of life that we would like people to live in in this country of dignity and respect, of having all of the concerns that we're concerned about answered not just for us but for everyone? Are we working on that level? The second person that comes to mind, SubhanAllah, is again someone very dear to all of us. And that is the example of Muhammad Ali. Again, may Allah bless him and raise his rank. I had the great honor and privilege of being able to attend his funeral. And something that really struck me 
was, an, that was the one day of my life that I remember that it was wonderful to be flying while Muslim. When I arrived in the Louisville airport, actually leaving the funeral, I was treated like a celebrity. It was red carpet treatment. Everyone was friendly. The people of Louisville were friendly. I went to a restaurant, all the, you know, the waitresses in the hotel, people that would normally, unfortunately, be stereotypically considered, let's say, redneck or whatnot. They came to me and to other Muslims that were at the hotel just to talk to us about Muhammad Ali. They were happy to have us there. They showed love for us because of the love that they had for Muhammad Ali. And he is, I think he's a perfect example of what it really means to be relevant in the way that we live our Islam. And to be truthful in the way that we live our Islam. It was a moment where I realized that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the turner of the hearts. Just a few weeks ago, it was something else that was in the media. We were facing Islamophobia, or I want to call it anti-Muslim hate as a community. There was something going on here, something going on there. And we were a troubled community. But in the passing of a Muslim, who represented all of the wonderful values that we believe in and that the society around us appreciates, we realize, subhanAllah, that Allah is the one who controls our condition. In just a moment, we as a community witnessed about a week where it was actually really wonderful to be Muslim and to be associated with someone like Muhammad Ali. And then it was taken away again after the Orlando shooting. But it was a sign from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that it's very easy for Allah to turn the hearts of the communities and the society around us. And look at who he turned people's hearts towards. Actually, I was shocked myself because I didn't know him personally. I knew of him. He was a figure. He's someone you study in school. But I was questioning myself, why do I feel such a level of grief upon his passing? You know. I, you know, why am I shedding tears for someone that I don't know? And I realized, subhanAllah, that when Allah loves someone, He places the love of that person in the hearts of everyone. And we saw the sign at His funeral. If you looked at His funeral, and the people who came to pray Janazah, and even the people who came who just wanted to watch the Janazah, you have people of other faiths there, you have Muslims from every ethnic background, Every social class, you know, every category of life that you can think of was represented in the people who came to pray upon him. Those were the people that he touched. And then if you look at what happened afterwards when they're driving, you know, to the cemetery and through the streets, people are just rushing, throwing roses on the car just to be there. And they're screaming in the streets, Ali, Ali, Ali. People of other faiths are screaming the name of Muhammad Ali because of how much love they had for him. Even Trump tried to make it to the funeral. That's how relevant he was. That a white, I mean, a person who represents white supremacy felt like I, can't, I have to somehow get myself into this. That's a big deal. Now, what were some of the things that he did? Who was he? Well, one of the things that we take from that is that we need to try to become of those who are beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have to start that as an individual journey. Because if we are beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a people, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will put a love in the hearts of everyone for our community. Our institutions, we have to try to make them beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because if those institutions are beloved to Allah, they will be beloved to everyone. And that requires sometimes a little bit of difficult self-assessment. You know, what purposes do the institutions serve? And do we fall into a 
a trap where the ends justify the means? Do we sometimes go outside what Allah would love and what Allah is pleased with in order to do what is immediately utilitarian, what immediately seems to appease the situation? Sometimes for those who are working in the field of so social justice, especially, and Muslims in particular, people come to that field thinking they have to prove themselves on the platform. And to some extent, you do. But you don't have to prove yourself using the exact si same paradigm that everyone else is using. We have the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu as an example. We have the Sira as an example. We have our faith and the heritage that it provides us as our way. We don't have to look to trends that come out of liberal thought, trends that come out of a university classroom as our methodology of social change because parts of that methodology may not agree with Islam. And that requires for ourselves a level of self-assessment but also some izza. That I am confident in my prophet I am confident in my faith, and I believe it has something to offer the whole world. I don't need to prove it to a university. I just need to expose. I don't need to prove myself. I just need to practice my faith. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, righteousness is not that you turn your faces to the east or the west, but righteousness is one who believes in God in the last day, and the angels, and the book, the prophets, and gives of his wealth for the love of God to relatives, orphans, the needy, the traveler, those who ask for help and for freeing slaves, and who establish prayer and give zakah, those who fulfill their promises when they promise, and those who are patient in poverty and hardship and during battle. Those are the ones who have been true, and it is those who are the righteous. Piety is not just a personal practice. We recognize that. But for it to be relevant, Iman is automatically associated with the service of marginalized peoples, people who need help. That's what Iman should push us to. And it should be grounded in faith, the pillars of Salah and Zakah. And it should be held up and dignified through character, being dependable being true to our word, and being able to practice patience in times of difficulty and hardship. I want to make a very specific request. We can talk about the abstracts of what it means to be socially relevant in America. You know, helping different categories of people who do need help, helping everyone. But I have a very, very specific request. One of the qualities of our faith is that it brings all kinds of different people together. And so whatever work we're doing, we need to ask ourselves, who is not at the table? Who can we bring to the table? How can we get everyone to join in on this? How can the small thing that we're doing become of benefit to everyone around, Muslim and non-Muslim in some cases, you know, people of uh, different cultures, you know, the people who may not be able to afford, for example, coming to a mass convention, right? People who may not be able to afford coming to some of the more expensive programs we're offering. How can we make our work something that is easily accessible to everyone and palatable? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَلَوْ أَنْفَقْتَ مَا فِي الْأَرْضِ جَمِيعًا مَا أَلَّفْتَ بَيْنَ قُلُوبِهِمْ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ أَلَّفَ بَيْنَهُمْ إِنَّهُ عَزِيزٌ حَكِيمٌ He says that if you were to have spent everything in the earth to unite their hearts, you could not have united them. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who united them. And He is the Almighty, the All-Wise. So this unity that we're seeking in the greater community, this unity that we're seeking amongst ourselves, the unifier is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And He is capable of unifying all of us. He is capable of unifying us with the greater society. The Aus and the Khazraj, two warring tribes in Medina, they invited, these verses are about them, they invited the Prophet Muhammad 
into their city because they saw Islam as a faith that would resolve a lot of their internal conflicts. And our contribution to America be one, needs to be one that helps to resolve a lot of its internal conflicts. It cannot contribute to its internal conflicts. We have to be the people who take the moral high ground on many different issues that are dividing our community and our country. We need some ta'lif. And we need to make spaces for people. We need a middle ground. That means not everything should happen in a masjid. That means sometimes you take your program to a library or a cafe. Sometimes you do the work in places that you're not comfortable with. Sometimes you reach out to people that you have nothing seemingly in common with. And this discomfort that comes with being relevant and practicing our faith in a dynamic way is something that, yeah, it's, it's going to be uncomfortable. If you're used to isolating yourself and only working on one issue, it's only going to be Palestine. It's only going to be this issue. Then perhaps the purpose of your work has less to do with pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a general way and more to do with working for a particular uh, affiliation or a nation. We all suffer in isolation. We all suffer in isolation. Social media represents what happens to people in isolation. Their anger is expressed, you know, in virtual reality. What we need is for people to actually physically come together, physically develop this togetherness. And it's going to be hard, but I leave you with this verse. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu he tells us that a Muslim who interacts with others and is patient in facing all the hardship that comes through this engagement is a better Muslim than one who isolates themselves from people and is not patient. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is described as someone who is more generous than the free-blowing wind. His presence affected everyone. His presence benefited everyone. Anyone, even the plants, the animals, the trees, everyone benefited from him. Islam and, and the, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa was not just sent to the Muslims, he was sent to mankind. Are we, in our work, in our lives, are we only dealing with ourselves or are we dealing with all of mankind? May we be as generous and exemplify the generosity of the Prophet Muhammad may we be like the free blowing wind Jazakumullah khair, assalamu alaikum